Well, welcome to our uh, final seminar of the semester uh, as part of the um, Mellon Sawyer seminar series on democratic citizenship and the recognition of cultural differences. Um, we thought that since we keep talking about democracy, we should have someone come and actually address that theme, uh, which will be um, the distinguished speaker today, Philippe Schmitter. Um, and I will introduce him in a moment, but I also wanted to let you know that next semester we have a bunch of very exciting um, talks, including by Carol Gilligan, with a comment by our very own Virginia Held, who will be talking about um, applying her care perspective, their care perspectives to this issue of recognizing cultural differences, which will be very creative, and uh, a whole bunch of others, including Will Kimlicka and um, uh, Joan Scott and some other people. So um, you should all stay tuned for the invitations to that. And if you know anyone else who would be interested in coming, please feel free to uh, bring them along. Uh, we just request RSVPs. Today, um, we'll be following our usual procedure, which is um, to have uh, our speaker, and then we'll take a short break to be followed by the commentator and hopefully ample time for discussion back and forth. Um, I'd like to thank my co-organizers, um, Ruth O'Brien and Richard Wollen and Omar Dabur as well as our terrific staff of uh, our assistant, John McMahon, who's been doing great videography and audio. And you can find the videos, we forgot to talk about this, but anyway, the videos of our um, <laughs> presentations um, on our website as well as on the uh, Center for Global Ethics and Politics website. And iTunes University carries the audio. So uh, we're hoping to um, get the, um, talks out to a broader audience and have them engage in the issues. I heard that the last one, which featured um, Shayla Ben-Habib and Ayala Shachar, was live, live tweeted during our uh, talk. So we're being very up to date here. Um, thanks, too, to all the Mellon Fellows who have been um, very good about attending, and to our postdoctoral fellow, Adam Ettenson, and our um, two RAs, Josh Keaton and uh, Flan Amdahl. So, finally, I'm turning to the introduction of today's speaker, who is one of the foremost theorists in the world uh, of democracy and democratization, if not the foremost theorist. And um, he's, Philippe Schmitter has published books and articles on comparative politics, on regional integration in Western Europe and Latin America, on the transition from authoritarian rule in Southern Europe and Latin America, and on the intermediation of class, sectoral, and professional interests. His current work, or at least current when we printed out this bio, um, from which we printed it, is on the political characteristics of the emerging Europolity. This is wish fulfillment here. Um, okay. On the consolidation of democracy in southern and eastern countries, and on the possibility of post-liberal democracy in Western Europe and North America. Professor Schmitter was Professor of Political and Science at the European <coughs> University Institute in Florence in the Department of Political and Social Sciences until September 2004, which is where I met him when I had the honor of being Fulbright Chair over there. He, he's now Emeritus in the Department of Political and Social Sciences at the European Univer University Institute. And he's written numerous books, book chapters and articles including The Future of Democracy in Europe, Trends, Analyses, and Reforms, that was a 2004 book, as well as How to Democratize the European Union and Why Bother, question uh, mark, in 2000. Um, his talk today is actually has a slightly different title from the one that was uh, sent around. I apologize for that, same general idea. It's actually entitled The Future of Real Existing Democracy. Philippe, welcome. Thank you very much, Carol, and thank all of you who made this possible. Thank you all for coming. I gather this is a somewhat awkward moment in the academic year, but uh, thank you. Um, yes, the title got changed. I, I don't know whether the idea was that uh, sticking real existing 
in front of democracy was somehow alienating or would turn off the audience. But, but I meant that seriously. And it, it, the implication, of course, is that it's not the future of democracy as we might understand it in some sort of normative or abstract terms, but political systems that call, uh, you have three criteria, political systems that call themselves democracies, political systems that are accepted by other political systems that have called themselves democracy and gotten away with it, right? And then finally, more or less correspondent to what Bob Dole once called polyarchy. So that will give you an idea. It's not democracy. It's sort of what is practiced in the name of democracy that I'm going to talk about. I'm also going to be very Eurocentric uh, in my remarks. That's partly because that's where I live and for some time, and that's what I know about. And I can't pretend that I understand that much about American politics. I never have, in fact. As Ira over there knows, <laughs> I rely on other people who do good work on American politics. But there is something fairly uh, uh, puzzling, if you just, just, just as a footnote. Um, in the past, I'm thinking the past when I was a graduate student, the, the terms used to be inverted. Americans celebrated the fact a, that they had such consensual politics and there were centripetal forces so that Republicans and Democrats were practically indistinguishable from each other. And that um, the, um, this was described wonderfully by, I think, Marty Lipset. In the, one of the best things about the American political system at that time was what they called slack, the fact that people didn't bother to vote for example, and generally had much lower levels of membership in trade unions and other kinds of associations than Europeans did. So the idea was that American democracy was a good, stable democracy, and these Europeans were ideologically polarized, much too mobilized in trade unions and political parties, etc., and therefore European democracy was intrinsically unstable as opposed to American democracy. And of course, it's exactly the opposite today. Today, European political parties, it's very difficult for people to distinguish them one from the other, except on the fringes, and the fringes are growing. We'll talk about that in a minute. But also, uh, the whole scenario, if you wish, of slackness, as we'll see, is now more in Europe. It's the United States where voting behavior and voting, let's, let's say, the circus of elections is more appealing than in the case of Europe. I'll come back to that in a minute. Anyway, now, <clears throat> I began to think about this. It was mentioned in one of these this little book we did for the Council of Europe. Uh, I was asked by the Council of Europe to put together a group of scholars to work on the future of Europe in uh, a democracy in Europe. Right? And uh, then they had this very interesting idea of matching us. So we were nine, I think, we put, uh, put together. And then they matched us with li nine live politicians from all over, you know, east, west, north. I mean, we had a, a mayor from beyond the Arctic Circle. We had a former prime minister of Malta. Anyway, a weird European distribution, let's say, east, west, north, south. So that this seminar developed when we would do these papers on sort of what was happening to democracy in Europe, then we would be discussing these with these real live politicians who had been active uh, in uh, the legislative body of the Council of Europe. And I remind you, the Council of Europe is not the same thing as the European Union. Right? The, the wonderful thing about the Council of Europe is it's impotent. And therefore, they allowed us to say anything we wanted. Uh, and, and one of the nice things about this, I'll say a few things at the end, is that we were even asked to make suggestions on the basis of this analysis of what would improve the quality of democracy in Europe. Now, the EU will never give you that opportunity. I mean, they're you know, much too consequential or, or worried about their own reputation, shall we say. But anyway, that's the background of this. So when I started thinking about this, the, the first idea that came to my head was uh, Robert Dahl. I mean, you cannot really talk, I think, about contemporary democratic theory without some kind of encounter with Robert Dahl. And uh, 
One of the, his most interesting ideas is he even sort of, you can hear him puzzling, how is it that this concept, democracy, has remained as a descriptor over, you know, 1,000 years, more than 1,500 years, uh, when in fact what it describes is completely different. So here we have democracy, Athenian if you wish, or even in some places pre, and you have, of course, a series of, and yet somehow the name democracy survives despite the fact that what it is, the real existing, so to speak, is radically different in many, many aspects. And he calls these, he, he talks about three revolutions. Um, and the interesting thing is that his rev you can be in a revolution in Dahl's terms and not know it. That's kind of interesting. That is, these are revolutions that do not involve large-scale violence. They do involve very consequential changes in behavior of the rules and institutions of democracy. But you can go through one of these Dahlian revolutions and not quite realize what's happening. Or it's not until after, so to speak, that you suddenly become aware that somehow this word is being applied to something that is radically different. Now, Dahl specifies, oh, yes, I forgot. I, then I came up with this. Um, have you ever, this is, I live in Italy, of course. Uh, have you ever heard of De Lampedusa, the famous? So you arrive at the conclusion that democracy has survived because by changing it has remained the same. That's the famous, you know, if things are going to be, remain the same and ground here, they're going to have to change. So that's that strategy, so to speak. And so you conclude that democracy has survived as a word because certain things have not changed when everything else has changed, nevertheless. Anyway, <clears throat> the first one he talks about is size. And here it's pretty obvious that the democracy, as we understand it now, uh, and, and again, Western democracy, uh, has its origins in the city-state. And then it goes through a set of transformations. And the unit, so nobody believed until the, well into the 18th century, in fact, till the United States, really, that democracy was an appropriate form of government for any political system over a certain size. I think somebody calculated 6,000 some citizens or something so that that was somebody in Greek political thought even calculated the exact maximal number you could expect to have in a democracy. And then, of course, we got two revolutionary changes that made democracy suitable, at least first for a confederation, in the United States case, the Swiss case, Dutch case, etc., and then eventually for an even larger unit. And those two revolutions were federalism and representation. So democracy went from being, quote to speak, direct participation of a fairly restrained, but nevertheless numerous bunch of citizens into a form of indirect democracy in which representatives, so to speak, did most of the work, supposedly as agents of citizens who are the supposed principals in this particular arrangement. And so then we have, and we'll see later, that this constant expansion, if you wish, of the size of the unit that can be uh, democratized with the understanding, and here comes the revolution, is you have to do it differently. You need different kinds of institutions to practice democracy from a city-state to a national state and even a multinational state. The second is the revolution in the scale, uh, namely, the, and here the central concept is citizenship, and as Dahl observes, the first conceptions of democracy restricted it, obviously, to males, but not just males. I mean, only a subset of males, obviously not resident foreigners, not s slaves, and even people who didn't have a significant amount of property, etc. And then over time, we see this concept of citizenship expand until now it's fairly standard. It's just men and women without other kinds of restrictions, uh, whether... Uh, there's still the age limit, of course, 18 usually, sometimes even 16 these days. So the scope of citizenship, or those who are eligible to practice citizenship anyway, expanded. And then the final, or the scale, I mean, and then finally there is the scope. And that is what it is that democracies do. So initially it was conceived that democracies did relatively little. 
internal justice and external protection. And then over time, democracies then expanded greatly the activities of the state that they were supposed to be governing. And then you end up, of course, with something that looks like, quote, the modern welfare state as a kind of cumulative product. So those are the, the three, so to speak, size, scope, and scale. Now, what's really interesting about two things are interesting. First is this question, you, you can be in this without knowing you're in a revolution. I don't know how revolutionary the, the participants felt who actually brought this about. But the most interesting feature is that they happened sequentially and that you can actually argue that they were causally related to each other. That is, moving from the city-state to something like a nation-state actually then changed the conditions under which uh, you could practice government, particularly through representation, even more so, of course, in the case of federalism and more so even when that federalism was over multi, multiple religions, multiple ethnic, multiple linguistic groups, etc. And of course it was the expansion of citizenship that led to the pressures for the expansion of the scope of government, particularly of course various forms of protection against the social, economic, and risks of various kinds. So that's the Dalian one. Now, what I've been thinking about is, you know, Dahl wrote this about 1960, I think. Um, what about other revolutions? So the basic structure of this essay is what are the revolutions that we have recently experienced and are still with us, so to speak, and what are the emerging revolutions that democracy is going through? Now, and I've come up with two that are more or less over and two and a half that are, so to speak, embryonic or developing very rapidly uh, and have done so over the last 30 or 40 years, let's say. And here, the most important um, general message I drew from this is that in the case of the Dahl revolutions, they were spaced out with more or less 100 to 150 years between the various revolutions. So there was, so to speak, a major change in practices and institutions. They led then, after some delay, to major changes in the definition of citizenship, which in turn led to major changes in what it is that democracies were expected or compelled to do by their citizens, so to speak. In this case, and what makes the future of democracy so much more difficult to understand is these are going on simultaneously. So two, as I, th as I will say in a minute, have more or less run their course, and they are permanent features of the democracy we live in, even if much political theory has yet to catch up with this, and certainly the extent to which political theorists rely on liberal and other 19th century versions, if you wish, of democracy, fail to understand the significance of those two. But they're here, they're done, and they're practically irreversible, I think. And then finally, there are two and a half that are going on now and I think irrevocably changing the nature of democracy. But the fact that they interact, they're going on simultaneously, means that it's very difficult to predict the outcome. It would be much easier if you could find a kind of set, a sequence, if you wish, and trace out the relationships. Instead, we're in a situation where these major changes in rules and institutions is occurring within the same time frame. Okay, here is the first of the two post dalian revolutions. The displacement of individuals by organizations as the effective citizens of real existing democracy. Democratic theory still talks almost incessantly and almost exclusively as if the citizens were individual persons. When in fact, in modern democracies, individual persons, unless they are members of organizations and unless they can invoke the support of organizations, have, you know, they vote. And as well, voting, we can talk about that, but certainly in Europe, voting turnout, voting significance, uh, et cetera, is going down. So even just the, the one archetypical 
individual act, let's say, is declining very Im importantly in Europe. Um, but nevertheless, the real politics of Europe is taking place in the bargaining between organizations. So that you get these first hints of this in Madison and in Tocqueville. Madison talks about factions and Tocqueville talks about associations. But neither of them imagined that these factions or associations would become permanent, bureaucratically run, professionally staffed, etc., etc., organizations. So if you read Tocqueville, you will get a sense of what he discovers in America, this, what he calls the, the art of association, being much more significant in America than it was in Europe of his time. <clears throat> but he doesn't imagine that these are going to be permanent organizations. These are spontaneous collections of people, and the examples he gives are of that nature, it would have never occurred to Tocqueville to believe that these organizations would then bureaucratize, permanently organize, and be able to follow politics beyond the life of their own members. So the organizations, the big difference of an organization is that it establishes routines, ideologies, or routine practices that can be projected beyond the life of their own members and affect the interest and conception of interest of their members. The other problem, of course, is that organizations have interests of their own. So the idea that it makes no difference if it's an organization or an individual because individuals compose organizations and therefore organizations are the simple aggregate sum of the preferences of their members or followers or whatever it is is nonsense. Organizations have interests of their own and they get built into the political process and play a role in socializing and controlling, and controlling may be too strong, but influencing the conceptions that their members have of their interests. Second, post Dalian, and I think closely related to this, it would take some research to sort of follow this out through political careers or whatever. The second is the professionalization of the role of politician. Most democratic theory assumes that democratic leaders are people like citizens. They're just a little bit more interested in politics and that they have fundamentally, so to speak, similar life preferences. Uh, they may be, of course, more prominent in their community or whatever it is, but nowhere will you find a hint certainly not in liberal political thought of the 19th century, well into the 20th century, that politicians would form a profession. These are people who enter and they expect to spend their entire life as politicians. They may get defeated. My friends who are politicians in Latin America anyway now have followed the Americans. They, they create a foundation for themselves. So if you, uh, if you, uh, you know, have uh, presidents usually cannot perpetuate themselves in power nowadays more than two terms. And what do you do? You found a foundation, create a foundation, and you stay in politics, of course. You remain. And so the idea that profession, that the politicians would be a distinctive career path and have distinctive interests and life experiences from those who voted for them or who contributed to them in one way or another. Right? Just doesn't appear in much of, if not all, of democratic theory. And yet the evidence is massive. There's a good deal of research on this in Europe. I don't know the American research so much, but there's a good deal of research on Europe, which demonstrates very convincingly that most politicians then are professionals. And they even plan it when they're graduates, or not graduates, students, undergraduates in law school usually, but nevertheless, this is, I think has become the rule rather, and it's interesting because this was a very much an issue in Eastern Europe because they thought, of course, it was felt that Eastern Europe would be different because these new people coming to power would be, quote, dissidents, and therefore they wouldn't be already, so to speak, a plan. They hadn't a planned career or had not entered the so-called nomenclatura as professional bureaucrats, rulers, whatever you want to call them, they quickly became professional. So even if many of them have other origins, academic life or whatever it is, once they've gone into politics, they are looked as professionalized as politicians in Western Europe these days. So the professionalization of the role of politician then is the second one. And I think you can see how they fit together. 
So at the same time, you have this permanent organizational structure. Many of the politicians come from that, the most important cases, of course, and the leading uh, causal um, trend in this comes from uh, socialists from the left, right? So it's, it's the left that begins to talk about salaries for politicians. I mean, most of you realize that initially politicians were not paid or barely paid. Switzerland, to this day, does not pay salaries to its deputies. It pays a per diem. And I'm told by Swiss politicians that the per diem is not enough to, to, even, to live on in Bern uh, when you're there. And, they, and this is a problem that only meets two months out of the year, so let's not exaggerate. It's not a, a particularly active bunch. But nevertheless, nevertheless, uh, then you look at them and you discover, even precisely because they're not paid, which is supposed to prevent their professionalization, three quarters of the deputies in the Swiss parliament are officials or paid by interest groups of one kind or another, business associations, professional associations, trade unions, etc. So in effect, if you don't pay them to be professionals by making the salary, so to speak, of a politician attractive, somebody else <laughs> will step in and pay for the professionalization uh, if you don't do it. So those two, I think, you know, they begin in the last third or so of the 19th century, and they accelerate, so to speak. And in a sense, they're irreversible. I mean, take the experience, and this is, incidentally, this is never even mentioned in Europe. We discussed this in our working group among European this is social scientists and, 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 and politicians. Term limits, that's not an issue in Europe. No one's ever dared bring it up, among other things. In part, actually, because there's more turnover in office in Europe than in the United States. The House of Debt, uh, excuse me, the, um, what does it call it? The, the House of Congress, no, the, uh, this sounds ridiculous, what? House of Representatives, yeah, uh, is, is notorious for uh, the fact that most of its uh, you know, constituencies are non-competitive, and so if you don't die or you just get sick of the job or whatever it is, you'll stay there forever, right? Anyway, the Americans, of course, have experimented with term limits and they haven't worked, right? So you can see this, any of the studies I've seen in California where they just simply park themselves away for one term or they go into something else and then come back in again. So it seems to be irrepressible. There seems to be nothing we can do about the professionalization. And it's even worse than that. And this, I saw this the other day on the television. I was fascinated. There was a program on the television about political consultants. But <laughs> Americans who are political consultants in Latin America, Eastern Europe. Uh, so we have the, the idea that not only are you a professional politician, but you surround yourself by professional staff, right? Obviously, survey, most of them are political scientists. Many of them are political scientists, right? So it's a, it's a job opportunity for political science graduates. And they're taking this all over the world. So these consultants don't just consult for the purpose of American elections or politics, they're all over the place, including many European countries. But, and then gradually, of course, countries develop their own consultancy system. But nonetheless, this is a, a diffusion of this professionalization out from the United States till it's affecting the politics of almost all real existing democracies. Now, two new ones, and then a half one. And the first one I also got from Robert Dahl. Robert Dahl talks about the role, and indeed the increasing role, of what he calls guardian institutions. He gets the term from Plato, but they're different than what Plato meant, but that's another matter. Uh, these are institutions within democracies that are explicitly designed not to be democratic. They are designed, usually they're called regulatory commissions or whatever, they're, you know, they have different names in different countries, but I think an independent regulatory commission. The worst, or the most extreme case these days uh, is our, our central banks, of course, but you know, it used to be the staff, independent staff of the army or the armed forces or whatever it is. You create these institutions specifically devolving upon those institutions important policy responsibilities and you make sure or you try to make sure that they are not affected by competitive political 
particularly party, pressures, right? So, and this has proliferated. And again, this is an American invention. I think the first of these regulatory commissions, that's the United States, the Federal something commission, trade, what is it, old boy? What is it? Commerce something, no? The railroad one. The railroad one, yeah. Yeah, okay. The Americans, but now it's everywhere, right? So this has now become increasingly significant. The result, of course, is that the remaining institutions of democracy find that they have whole areas of very controversial and significant policy making which are, have been assigned somewhere else, so to speak. So the idea, for example, that a parliament should tell a central bank what to do is just these days uh, an anathema. I mean, you, you cannot, you know, for one thing, you can't be a member of the euro unless your bank has these kind of special statutes to protect it from being democratic. Right? Now, all democracies have had undemocratic institutions within them, particularly the military, of course, is the main one, but this has proliferated. So that's it. The spread of guardian institutions, then, is uh, going on all the time. Um, and uh, it, it, we, it, I remember, what was this? Was this, was this Brazil? Where was it? Somebody, democracies without choice was one of the things you kept hearing when you would go to new democracies in Latin America and, and Eastern Europe. The, we are democracies without choice because most of the really significant things that people were interested in, like the value of their money <laughs> and interest rates and, and, and the safety of their food and all kinds of other things were in fact being dealt with outside of the standard competitive institutions of liberal democracy. The second new one is pretty much a European phenomenon and one that I've been involved in. In fact, it was involvement in that that got me into this business of the Council of Europe and advising the Commission and all this business. And that is, we, our jargon calls this multi-level governance. And usually, we add to that polycentric government governance or systems of governance. And of course, the main culprit is the European Union. Right? So the European Union is an unprecedented institution in the sense that it superimposes uh, an effective supranational layer of regulation and sometimes distribution, like agricultural policy, for example, not to mention structural <clears throat> regional policy, etc., which then is determined at a supranational level. It is also polycentric, and that's probably the most puzzling feature of it. Namely, when we started studying European integration, we had a, a model which was multi-layered. We kind of understood that. But we expected that as the European community, then called European Economic Community, changed its name three times, but anyway, the same thing, more or less, as it expanded, it's the scope of what it did. And as the authority to make decisions, now by qualified majority voting, that is to say decisions binding even on countries that do not vote for them, so that's unprecedented in international or interstate law, that would accumulate as it did in the process of national integration. So what took place in the national integration of France or Great Britain or Spain or whatever it was, this accumulation and these institutions would become part of a central state, in this case a supranational state with the presumed center being of Brussels. Right? Now if you study the European Union, not only do you have the central bank in Frankfurt and you have the court in Luxembourg and you have the, and then the, the parliament goes back and forth between Strasbourg and, 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 but according to one of my students, there are now 18 different European regulatory agencies and each one is in a different country, of course, as you can imagine. So the food and safety is the one that, uh, but this is an anecdote, I mean, this is a very famous moment in this. Um, they had a list, and Italy already had one. I can't remember, it's in Torino. I can't remember what it is. Something at like work conditions or something like that. So Italy had already got its European institution, and Finland was supposed to get the next one. And the next one was this Food Safety Institute. Were you there at the time when Berlusconi, okay. And then Berlusconi had a fit, 
And he said, how can you possibly locate a food safety institute in Finland, of all places? And then he would say, and they don't even know what prosciutto is. Right? The Finns, of course, immediately turned around and said, and you don't know what dried reindeer meat is either. Right? So, 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 but this is a typical, you know, what happens in this crazy thing called the Amer European Union. But the point was that as these institutions come, Where did it it ended up half in, I forgot, Tampere, I think, in Finland, and the other half in, in, in Parma. Okay, so, no, but the, but the important thing here is these poly centers of decision making in the European Union, each one of them has its own treaty basis, its own internal rules, and its own way of operating, so to speak. So there isn't a standard kind of EU model, so to speak. Each one of these has its own basis, its own funds, right, and its own treaty, as I say, treaty basis with usually all member states, but not always. In some cases, you can opt out, for example, if you choose to do so, if you're already a member. So multi-level governance is a new feature. I'm sure you all know that there are Somebody, I think, calculated something like 150 uh, supra, so not supranational, but transnational regional organizations. So the EU might have been the first, but not the first. The first was the Organization of American States. But anyway, there's all of these regional. I mean, none of them, of course, has the decision-making capability or, for that matter, the finance uh, strength of, of the EU. But still, there is this general process of creating these upper level institutions. And in some places like uh, South America, Mercosur, or ASEAN, etc., these have become had some significance, even if it's not even close to that of the EU. So that's the, oh, there's another process too. And don't, people don't, in the case of Europe, you not only have the creation of a supranational level, but you also have the expansion of the sub-national level. So everybody pays attention to the evolution since 1958 well, for the Rome Treaty, but even earlier than that of the emergence of these embracing supra-national units. But almost every single European country has also introduced greater degrees of autonomy by devolving various kinds of tasks to sub-national units. Spain is, of course, the extreme, perhaps, of these. It doesn't call itself a federal state, but in many ways, the so-called estados autonomicos of Spain have even greater autonomy than, say, uh, American states or Canadian provinces or, or whatever it is, right? Footnote also, because this is interesting in terms of the, 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 the emerging properties for democracy. One of the assumptions about federalism uh, is that the component units of a federal state, that is the subnational units, have the same rights and obligations. So, irrespective of size, of when you joined, or whatever it is, supposedly. Now, Canada is already a bit of an exception because Quebec has always insisted on a special kind of status. So the code word for this, and this is a code word which is ap applied, although nobody in Europe likes to talk about Euro-federalism anymore. It's, it's, the British are allergic to it, so you can't mention it or they get very upset. But is asymmetric federalism. So again, what you're doing is you're setting, you're, you're changing the levels of aggregation at which decisions are made, and you're adding layers, in some cases layers that didn't exist before. In other cases, they existed before, but they get increased tasks or competence in the French term. But you don't necessarily do it equally for all of the units. You do it asymmetrically. And of course, that's what the EU looks like. The EU is an asymmetric organization. And the most obvious case of this is right now the Eurozone. So you have 27, I think maybe Croatia's joined by now, 28 member states, and it's only 17 of those are members of the Eurozone. The Schengen, the, the, the open borders business, I think it has 18 members or something like that. So those are, again, built in is a new kind of 
political format. The problem from the point of view of democracy is you don't know for sure who is responsible for what. Because since there is no constitution that was rejected, and even the constitution that they proposed didn't do the job, see, normally when you have multi-layered system like an American federal system, let's say, or Canadian or Australian or whatever, there's a constitution which pre-establishes the assumption about which responsibilities, which policies will be uh, practiced, and therefore which political authorities will be responsible for those practices in these different levels. In the case of the EU, there is no constitution. The EU can do anything it damn well pleases, as long as its member states agree to it. My favorite example is environmental policy. The EU issued 180 directives concerned with environmental policy. It's the leading producer of rules for environmental standards in Europe, much more so than the national states. The national states are literally uh, subsumed under these. And the word environment never appeared in a single treaty. They just did it without any explicit treaty-based agreement. But they agreed on it, and that was enough. So here you have a strange kind of multi-layered system in which citizens don't know who's responsible. One of the favorite games <laughs> What time is it? I got us. Whoop. Oh my. One of the favorite games in Europe, of course, is the national politicians keep saying it's not my fault. Brussels forced me to do it. You know, so that's, that's typical. You pass on the and, uh, footnote. I live in the countryside. And uh, just before the hunting season, about five years ago, all of a sudden, on the city bulletin boards, a new decree by the Italian government, but explaining that this was because of the EU, which limited the hunting season by an extra two, it lopped off, I think, two weeks of the hunting season, and then produced a long list of birds and animals you weren't supposed to shoot because they were endangered, you know, whatever. Of course, <laughs> my neighbors, uh, they didn't think they were endangered. In fact, there were too many of them, but that's another, I mean, that, because that was a, a European decision that somehow a certain deer were endangered, but they sure as hell are not endangered in my neighborhood. They're all over the place, a wild boar or whatever. They're all over the place. But anyway, the point was that this was coming down from Brussels, telling people how long they could hunt and what they could hunt. Right? And no one, was, no one was prepared for this. The Italian government never told them it was coming. It just suddenly appeared, plastered on the, on the walls uh, of, our, uh, the, of the Comune, right? I mean, in Pontesieri. Now, you could imagine. I mean, who in the hell is Brussels to tell us? Because it turns out that, I didn't know this, but it turns out that the hunting uh, business or hunting policy has been determined for five or six hundred years at the level of Tuscany, the Grand Duchy and, and, and previous. So this was something which was by long before the existence of the Italian state was already something which was being taken care of, so to speak, by these sub-national units. And then all of a sudden this European business falls on them. Nobody knew what to do about it because you didn't know who to protest because you didn't really understand how it was. These everybody blames Scandinavians. I love this. Everybody, <laughs> it's, it's those damn Scandinavians who who like to look at these birds and we want to eat them, right? Because they're, they're tasty and these Scandinavians don't eat these kind of birds. And no, it's a long. You can imagine. I mean, it's, uh, anyway, the point here is, imagine though, how do you design? effective democratic institutions when you do not know at what level which kinds of policies are going to be made. Right? We assume that in democratic theory, we assume we know what, so to speak, what the locus of decision is, but in a system like this EU system, you don't know. The one half one. I don't know whether to take this seriously or not. And it's simplified, it is, is exemplified by this concept of governance. Uh, so, some of you know I mean, that governance appeared. It's an old French term from the, I think, 13th or 14th century, but it disappeared. And then it came back again when the World Bank uh, rediscovered in 1989, I think it was, in a report on 
the problem of uh, African aid to Africa. They didn't, their, their statutes prohibited them from interfering in the internal affairs of member governments. So they invent, they found this damn French word and they suddenly said, well, the real problem of Italy is not corrupt governments, which it was, it's <laughs> governance, right? So uh, it was just completely uh, fortuitous or opportunistic, let's say. And yet, I don't believe there's a concept in the history of either political science or politics which has diffused more rapidly than this concept of governance. It's everywhere and all different kinds of levels. It's, it's now... I, I, we could do, we can't do a good search, we can't do a good search on charisma because it's too late, but, but I, I mean that was Max Weber, I don't think it went that fast, Max Weber, I mean anyway, this one is everywhere, right? And of course it's usually preceded by the word good, and even worse, democratic, right? So the assumption is that this thing, now I don't know if this thing exists, right? I mean I've had some students who work on this, but you know, it's not, it's not easy because no one knows what it is. The big advantage of it is that nobody can define it. And therefore, it's a, it's a useful word simply because it's not the word government, right? So governance sounds like it somehow in this neoliberal world. Uh, it sounds like it must be something better than government. And therefore, you put good or democratic in front of it. Now, if it's serious, then it's a serious challenge to what we think of or what we call real existing democracy for three reasons that I can think of, but I'm sure there are other ones. The first one, of course, is that it radically redefines the central principle of democratic theory, and that's the principle of citizenship, political equality, because citizens in governance regimes are replaced by people who are called stakeholders. Stakeholders are not equal. They're not all of us. Stakeholders are some subset. And it's not exactly an accident that that subset usually owns property or has some kind of specialized expertise, right? So you end up creating these decision-making units which justify themselves, bounding themselves, inviting participation, so usually, of course, from above, inviting participants who are called stakeholders. And yet that stakeholders are hardly a random sample of the population it would be different if you define stakeholders as a random sample of the population. Nobody does that. They mean by that property groups and experts of various kinds and that's... That. The second thing is that in the ideology of governance, the decision-making norm, you never vote in governance systems. That's considered corrupting or disturbing or whatever. You, you make decisions by consensus. So democracy equals making decisions by consensus. I didn't say unanimity by consensus. If it were unanimity and you needed the explicit consent of everybody, including other citizens or those who are represented by stakeholders or whatever, then it would be a different matter. So cons consent then becomes the dominant rule over which you are supposed to be governing this system. That's not necessarily democratic. Consensus formation actually allows for, even encourages, all kinds of manipulations, both of the initial information but also of the actual behavior. People can dissent by simply leaving, for example, or whatever, and you still get a consensus, but it's not necessarily a consensus which is, would be backed by a majority had it been put to a vote, especially of the general citizenry. Hmm? Make sure you get to your what is to be done section. Oh, oh good grief. Oh, okay. So anyway, there are other reasons about governance that I, but I just, I just call this to your attention because it's become such a fashion. And uh, if it means anything, then it means something uh, very significant uh, changes. Now, in this little book we did for the Council of Europe, we were invited to think about various kinds of reforms. In the light of this transformation that's going on in European democracies, what could you do to reverse some of these trends, like decline in electoral turnout, for example, uh, making elections somehow more competitive, uh, interesting people, getting people more interested in politics, et cetera, et cetera. So we made 28 
suggestions. I can't possibly give them all to you, but I'll give you a flavor for just two or three just to show you. Some of these have actually been, it was interesting because we thought we were coming up with it, and then we discovered somebody was doing it. We thought these were, were, were uh, you know, completely off the wall ideas, and then we discovered that it was, the, the first off the wall idea was called universal citizenship. You would be a citizen from the very moment you were born, presuming you were born in a situation which assigned you <laughs> by birth, so to speak, to where you lived, or your parents' uh, nationality, whatever it was, you would be a citizen. Except that the right to vote would be exercised by one of your parents until you reach the age of political maturity, 16, 18, whatever it is. Right? And the obvious problem that we were trying to resolve there was twofold. One is the whole question of the aging of the population and the fact then that, especially with this increased scope of public policy, more and more is devoted to retired people or older people and less and less to people just entering the job market or, for that matter, entering the education system. So there's a distortion in the distribution of, and therefore, if you had to think more about future generations, but the other real reason that now this is absolutely fascinating me, one of the things we came across was this enormous decline in party identification and party membership. I have friends who do survey research in Eastern Europe, and they ask on these surveys, "Are you a member of a political party?" And they have a problem getting anybody to say yes. They've had surveys with 3% of the population only will admit to being a member of a political party. And if you ask people, or do you identify, is there a political party with which you identify, you can get as low as 20 to 25%. So something's happening there. There's a you know, misfit. And one of the reasons for this, and this comes from the American literature, I learned this from the, this was the literature that uh, Kenny Pruitt used to contribute to, remember? Political socialization. That is, the basis of party affiliation, party membership, et cetera, or at least identification would be intergenerational transmission of, you know, the parents were Republican, you're more likely to be, you're not always going to be, but you're more likely to be. And the stronger they were Republicans, the stronger you are likely to become a Republican or a Democrat. Now, what I came across was literature. I know the Italian literature better, but it seems to be true elsewhere in Europe as well on the intergenerational transmission of political values. In surveys taken in the late 1960s, early 1970s, 85% of young Italians could tell a, you know, what do you call them, inquirer, a researcher, um, what the political, who their parents voted for. It didn't mean necessarily they vote the same way, but they, could, they knew who their parents, it's now below 30%. People just don't know or don't care. Or, even more likely, the parents don't even know. That is to say, the probabilities that they will vote twice in a row for the same party is much lower than it used to be. So there's confusion even in the adult behavior, not to mention in this transmission of values. So the idea was if you, had, if you made children into citizens and mama or papa voted, the children would start asking. Who did you vote for, Mama? And you would get some kind of communication, some kind of justification would have to be made of why you voted for Berlusconi, for example, whatever, or whomever. So anyway, that was one idea. Another idea was lotteries. You go to the, to the, um, to the polls, and at the same time you vote, you get a lottery ticket, and the same time the, the results of the elections are announced, the winners of the lottery will be announced. So then we, we liked this idea. It was my idea. But then the problem was, what would you win? And I sort of stupidly said, money. Nobody liked that. That smelled too much like some kind of indirect buying of votes or something like that. And so we, and then I, then, then uh, <laughs> Andras, a Hungarian who participated, Andras said, well, we will get companies to contribute to the prizes. So, you know, you get a Mercedes Benz and you get a holiday in the, in the Canary Islands or whatever, you know, and it'll all be paid for. You know, it won't cost the state anything, right? Nobody liked that either. And so we finally decided that what you would do is that you would win money, but you could only spend it on public goods. You could only give it to a state or a nonprofit, you know, 
NGO or whatever you want to call it, uh, organization in civil society. And therefore, you would get a million euros right, if you win the Hungarian national electoral lottery, and then you, and you would have a month to decide who to give it to. So you'd get the picture of the paper, you did your moment of glory, and then you'd have a month. And what I really liked about that is one of the problems of the, the, the democratic theory does not adjust is the difference between numbers and intensities. So this would have been a fab, because these people would be randomly selected, right? And they would determine, you know, do we want more care for battered women? Do we want more money for education? Do we, that's the kind of choices that this randomly selected bunch of winners would be making. And therefore, we would give you a better indication than survey research, which is one way this is discovered, or certainly than voting behavior, which is very opaque and very difficult to, to, to translate into these preferences. Then there's also no type voting. We discovered this was, this, this was happening. N-O-T-A, NOTA. Nobody heard that? I don't think it's in this country, but it's just in Ferris, in some places in Europe. Uh, Moldova has it. I'm trying to get a student to study Moldovan elections, but nobody seems to be terribly interested in this. It's called none of the above. So in every single election, you would have the official candidates nominated by political parties or self-nominated, whatever, huh? depending on the electoral rules, and then you'd have at the bottom, none of the above. I don't want any of them. Right? The obvious idea would be to capture those who do not vote because they don't want none of the above, but they have no clear way of expressing it. This would give you a chance to go to an election and say, I don't like any of these guys or women or whatever it is. right? And so nota voting was another. Uh, I can tell you that the politicians didn't like this too much, but <laughs> we, did, we did convince them. I mean, I could go on and on and find it. But it's just, it was, one of the biggest problems and that generates a high level of uh, mistrust in politicians uh, throughout Europe, as a matter of fact, is the fact that almost all European political parties are now funded predominantly with public funds. Right? So public funding of political parties is the norm in Europe. There's private money, sometimes it's, of course, subterranean, but nonetheless, uh, public funding of political parties is an established and considered a democratic conquest or advancement or whatever it is. The problem is, it's always corrupt. Right? So there's huge amounts of corruptions on how do you actually monitor what these parties are, how they spend the money. I mean, Italy happens to be a particularly egregious case, but it's, it's all over Europe that, that there are scandals for this, you know, in the public funds. Because public funds are based on the results of the previous election. So if you had 40% of the previous election and your opponent had 35% and somebody else had 20 or whatever it is, that's how you would distribute the public funds for the next election. So it was a kind of calculated oligarchic <laughs> policy to support those who've done well in the past, continue to be supported, and whether they had the following for this election or not. So my idea was that whenever you voted, you would also have a voucher and you would have 100, 200, whatever it is, euros. And you would not only vote for parties, but you would vote for which, how much money you would give to political parties. And you didn't have to give that money to the party you just voted for. You could give it to a rotating fund for new parties. So again, it's like no to voting. I don't want any of these. I'll vote for them because I have to, OK? But I want to see different political parties, and it would go into a rotating fund, and then with a certain kind of rules, you could draw on that fund to help support the formation of new political parties. And not a single one of these suggestions has been successful. I, I mean, this is, this, but it is, it is interesting that they have become now part of the public discussion, right? Especially this business of universal voting. There are several parliaments now which are discussing this idea that children should be enfranchised or at least made into explicit citizens. And that, so some of these have begun to enter into the discussion. Oh, and smart voting. Oh, do I have enough time? Smart voting. No, Sm that's OK. Say a few words. Smart voting. This is, this is an invention of a friend of mine. Actually, it's Swiss to start with, and then the Dutch do it. Everybody's doing it now in Europe. I don't know 
whether it's being done in the United States. Have you ever heard of something called smart voting? <laughs> we even organized it in, in Florence. Were you there when we were doing it? Okay. We did it for the European elections, but usually it's done for national elections. In an election, you send a questionnaire to all of the candidates. And you have, I don't know, 20, 40, whatever it is, questions. I think we had 25 for the European elections. And the candidates would check, you know, are you in favor of abortion or, you know, that kind of stuff, right? And then maybe some more than yes or no. But anyway, then you can take the same exam and the computer will tell you who you should vote for. Right? It will match you. It, and it will match you with a party. It will match you with an individual thing. It will even match you depending on the constituency. Given this particular constituency in Finland, you should vote for this. Right? So I did it. I turned out to be a member of the Finnish Pirate Party. <laughs> now, but that. that but no, but that does show a bit of a, I mean, I wasn't taking it that seriously, okay, that's a problem. So I was sort of joking, but, but I ended up joining vicariously, uh, unbeknownst to them, uh, the Finnish uh, Pirate Party <clears throat> by smart voting. Right? Uh, well, okay, thank you very much, Philippe. That was great. Is in both in philosophy and environmental studies there, and in earth and environmental sciences, and environmental psychology at uh, the CUNY Grad Center. He's published in Science Studies, Architecture, and Globalization. He's co-edited Technoscience and Cyberculture with Stanley Aronowitz, um, and his most recent work is on democratic theory, environmental philosophy, the global food system, and the state. He published a very uh, interesting article on Via Campesina in the Journal of Social Philosophy as well. Oh, my plug for my journal there. Uh, he's completing a monograph entitled, We Decide, Participatory Democracy in Theory and Practice. Mike. Thank you. Um, thanks to Carol yeah. for uh, inviting me to comment here. And uh, also thanks to Adam for all the logistical support for making that happen. Um, can you hear me? I'm good? Yeah. OK, great. So, um, well, I really enjoyed uh, Philippe's paper. I'm, um, uh, as Carol mentioned, finishing a, a monograph on participatory democracy, which is um, a, a different framework uh, at a couple of different levels, both in terms of conception and also in terms of understanding what the future and present and past of democracy is. Um, but I think there's a, a couple of different points of intersection, and, and Philippe, in, in his uh, list of proposals at the end, mentions one point of intersection, so I'm going to come to that. But I'm just going to talk a little bit about the conception of democracy I'm working with, uh, how it differs, and then um, I'll comment a little bit on the diagnosis of the contemporary uh, malaise or problems in which real existing democracies are facing, uh, as Philippe uh, articulated. But really, I want to focus on the proposals and kind of where we are in the future. So um, the, kind of, the conception of democracy that I, I come from, um, which is often called participatory democracy, which is derived from the title, well, actually, derived from a, a phrase which the Students for a Democratic Society get from a political science professor named Arnold Kaufman back in 1962. Um, and then Carol Pateman sort of gives it the political science baptism in her work on, uh, on participatory democracy uh, in theory. Um, sorry, what's the book called? I was, uh, the book is called Participation in Democratic, Participation theory. In Democratic theory. Thank you. Um, 1970. Uh, our, and, and also, in her, she gave the APSA address uh, two years ago, two times ago, I guess now, and actually was talking about where is participatory democracy now. And in her case study in that, in that address is, is the one I'm going to get to in a second. So the definition I'm working with, which um, is also one favored by Carol, is just the idea that, in a sense, democracy is a process by which we try to operationalize the equality of the group, of all the members of the group. And that can be in any kind of activity. It can be in the political sphere, it can be in the economic sphere, it can be in the social sphere. Um, Carol calls this sort of joint activity or common activity. So we could have examples of worker cooperatives that are very formalized. We could have uh, examples of, of collective households, which are maybe more informal. It could be in the, the incarnated into a property ar arrangement with a land trust. Um, it could be a political process, um, such as um, a, a particular a voting mechanism uh, or a jury. Uh, so that kind of definition kind of gives you this broad leeway 
and it's got a set of norms attached to it, and it's got a set of goals attached to it, and it can take place in a number of different sectors and in a number of different formats. Philippe, of course, is, is not commenting on that kind of conception, but is focused on what he calls the real existing democracies, um, and you know, goes a lot to Dahl's conception of polyarchy, uh, and is kind of working within, as he said at the beginning, that kind of conception. So for me, when just to kind of, if you're thinking about the future of democracy, I think a lot of the ro most robust kind of innovative forms, it's, from my perspective, lie outside of that framework of the real existing democracy framework, although it intersects with that framework, depending on the view, um, in a number of different ways, and depending on the locale, the geographic locale. So um, I would just name, for example, there's a lot of different forms of economic democracy. Uh, so, some are grouped under the category of the solidarity economy, which involve worker cooperatives and formation of alternative economies. Uh, sometimes it has, those movements have explicit relationships to states, as in the case of Brazil. But other times, they're much more antagonistic to states, uh, as in the case of Mexico. Or, uh, and then in Bolivia, they have more mixed models. Um, and, in the, in the, in, and again, in the European Union, they can sometimes have more formal ranges as well. So um, I think that when we're... Uh, so in any, in any case, so we're thinking about the future of, of democracy, uh, that would then you have a lot more things that would count as democratic and we would uh, sort of look at that uh, with a wider lens. I think that um, with, when you also, when you work with that conception, uh, there's a number of works that kind of look at the history of democracy, uh, the most recent being by Rockwell, which is called The Secret History of Democracy, uh, which came out last year, yeah. and looks at a lot of different... Very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah and looks at a lot of different cultural <clears throat> traditions uh, Persia, Southeast Asia. Uh, there's a number of people who've done work in indigenous philosophy. I'm more familiar with the, the case of the Iroquois in the United States and Haudenosaunee. Uh, Barbara Mann's work, Scott Pratt's work. Uh, even in the history of federalism, it's kind of interesting to think about the role of the, the so-called Iroquois Confederacy and the way it in, it, it's linked to the, the conception of federalism as emerges uh, in the United States. So, and I think in this kind of global moment, um, you know, when we're thinking about the future of democracy, it's very helpful to kind of think about those different ways in which those different institutional forms uh, that might articulate those concepts of equality and what it means to operation that equality and so on. And the Iroquois, very, uh, interestingly, had very interesting ideas of asymmetric federalism because the different nations had different uh, roles and obligations within that. So the Seneca had different obligations to the Onondaga. Now, I, I think that the, the point I want to kind of address uh, in intersecting with Philippe's pre presentation is um, around what's, uh, well, he calls for in his paper, and he didn't use his phrase today, but a reinvention of democracy. And then he asks, uh, is this reinvention a different form of democracy? And he says, yes, it can't just be a strengthening of the old model. And I kind of want to push him then on this, because I think that a lot of the examples that he gives, especially around voting and the inclusion of um, folks who maybe are, who are not allowed to participate because of citizenship issues. Uh, but it seems that they're still being organized around the same kind of institutional forms, which are very state-centric. And I think that uh, also you have that footnote on good governance where you're very skeptical. It seems like you're very skeptical or nervous about this good governance, and you were yeah. satirical in Ooh. your presentation of today, um, which is uh, appropriate in certain ways. Um, but that whole business of multilateral governance and then also the understanding that people have more than one loyalty or more than one affiliation. So there's sort of a bottom up and a top down, right? So people might just want to be loyal or be associated with many different polities. And then there's also this stakeholder model that's reorganizing how people participate in political institutions, not in terms of citizenship, but in terms of function and then your, your stake with respect to function. So whether it's food or it's the environment or it's the workplace and so on. Um, so you have these kind of two background conditions which are pushing for this reinvention of, govern, of government or governance. Um, and then how does that relate, you know, and, and then we could have a big discussion about whether or not these background conditions are helping to democratize governance or not. Um, and if they're making institutional bodies less accountable, then it would certainly seem that they're not democratizing, as you nicely point out. But a, another model that fits in here uh, is what's called participatory budgeting. Uh, and I uh, kind of come at this, uh, I've done a lot of uh, research on participatory budgeting, which is a, a kind of model of, of decision making that emerged out of uh, uh, Brazil uh, about 20 some years ago in Porto Alegre in the south. 
And the idea there is um, basically just that a municipal government, uh, and a lot of times it happens at the city level, not at the state level or at other jurisdictions. But at the city level, a part of the budget is transferred to the residents of some geographic uh, jurisdiction, either a, a district within the city or the, the whole city. And they decide how to spend those funds. So they're not consulted, but they actually have the power how to, to spend those funds. So um, I had gotten to go to Porto Alegre and, and kind of got involved with some folks and we've been trying to bring it to the United States and we finally got uh, an elected official in the United States to do it three years ago in Chicago, uh, an alderman by the name of Joe Moore. Um, and then he liked how it went and he came to New York and now we have eight uh, New York City Council members doing it uh, this year with about $10 million total. Uh, we had last year was the first year with four of them did it and this year eight of them are doing it. So I, I kind of want to come at it from the, the, the nitty gritty of this, of this example uh, and then kind of turn it back into Philippe to see what, how he thinks this fits in. Is this part of the reinvention of democracy or is this, this part of this good governance model that maybe causes more problems uh, than it pretends to solve? So with, with participatory budgeting, and it's done in, depending on how you define it, it's done in at least 1,000 cities globally, maybe 2,000 cities. Um, there are a number of European cities that do it very poorly uh, and do it very watered down, um, much less so than a lot of Latin American countries and in, in, in New York. Seville does it really well, um, but a, a lot, the Germans do it very poorly, I have to say. The Germans have got a great en energy policy. I give them credit for the energy policy shift over the last five years, but the, but the participatory budgeting is really unfortunate. So the key thing with participatory budgeting is it's not just a, a one-day event. It happens over the course of many months. So and in the first stage, you have uh, these town hall meetings where uh, people are talking about the needs of the community, and then they make proposals about how to address those needs in the community. So it'd be infrastructure projects. In New York, it's capital money. And then they work with city officials to develop those proposals into actual technically feasible and fiscally feasible projects. And they could be the projects in New York where it could be a garden. It could be widening a street to make it safer, uh, lights for parks, uh, a composting facility. Uh, these are all examples of projects that won in one of the districts. Um, and then at the end, the residents of that jurisdiction decide how the money is spent. So they vote on the proposals. And the great thing about participatory budgeting is the, the community decides what are the rules for voting. Now, and this goes to the citizenship, citizenship, but from a different angle. So in New York City, uh, the criteria for voting was just you had to be a, a resident of the district. So you didn't have to be a legal resident, you didn't have to be a citizen, you didn't have to be a registered voter. Uh, and that's because people thought, well, all these people pay taxes in some way. Um, so they should have a right o o in terms of influencing or actually choosing how capital funds are spent. So here you have a redefinition of citizenship, which most of us would regard as more inclusive. It's not like that stakeholder will, where you kind of define it, you know, more like who counts as more narrowly, where there's the notion of expertise or how much influence someone has in the community. And in order to get a lot of people to kind of come out and vote, though, there's a lot of outreach that has to be done. And as some of the folks know who've been participatory, participatory budgeting, uh, in the 45th district, um, it does take work to convince people that actually this is a different kind of process, that they're not just going to be consulted, that they're actually going to have power. Because at first people were like, yeah, right, we heard that, you know, we hear that every year. This is a different one, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, so that, after you kind of overcome that, so you have the, the institutionalization of this model. Now, one of the things I, I think Philippe really highlights, it's really crucial, is one of the things that comes up here then is the question of political labor. And that is, who's doing the politics and how are they compensated and how are they paid? So as someone who's now the chair, the, I, I still can't get used to this, I'm the president of the board of directors of the Participatory Budgeting Project, which is a um, nonprofit. So, and this is very disconcerting to me, to, you know, for a number of reasons. Um, but I'm honored at the same time. Um, now, you know, am I professionalized? Well, I'm not paid, uh, so I'm not fully professionalized. Uh, however, there are members in our organization who are paid, but they're not paid enough, so I have to fundraise for them to be actually, you know, make living wages. Um, and, and so, but the, what, one of the things that's happened is that, um, just to kind of call attention to a number of themes, what, uh, Vejo, California is the, the most recent town to do participatory budgeting, and, um, they're doing it there with the city council. They were the first town in California to go bankrupt during the fiscal crisis. So there was a big uprising against their city council. On the west coast, the city councils have a lot more power than the mayor. And they instituted a new tax to be able to cover some of their basic services that the city council was not covering well before then. 
So, and then they decide, but look, we, the people of Viejo are like, well, we don't really trust our city council, so we want to have the citizens or the residents want to have more power over that process. So we had been giving talks uh, out in California, and they heard about it, and so they said, okay, help us set up the process. So we helped set it up. And one of the first things we heard was the, the, municip the union. The municipal union was like, wait a minute. You're going to hire these people from New York to come in to tell us how to do democracy in Viejo. And so, now of course, when you put it that way, I wouldn't vote for it either, you know what I mean? Like, who are these people coming in? We're consultants, we're NGOs, we're gonna take money away from a bankrupt city. Um, and so there was a whole debate there, which I thought was great, about you know, who we were, our ideas, not just to try and you know, get Viejo to pay us you know, a certain amount of money for the next 10 years, but we kind of set up the process. The idea is to empower you how to do it, and then we leave once it gets set up. You know, after that first year, after that second year, we're gone. Um, I'll have to tell you later, if, as a business model, does this work? Um, but one of the interesting things was they decided that the people running the process there should be paid a fair wage but from the city budget. So they're actually, not, you know, wages there. That they're less than the union wage, though, who, that, in other words, that a city bureaucrat would have gotten for doing the same work. In New York City, we're not paid by the city a living wage to do any of this. In New York City, it comes out of the discretionary funds of each of the individual council members. Um, but the idea is that, well, you know, this work is volunteer work and, and so on. Um, but with so much, and I think that, okay, well, what, how is this relevant to the reinvention of democracy? One of the things you really highlighted about this idea of a professionalized political class, some of the most innovative participatory democracy movements, their antipathy is mostly directed at that political class. It's not a, political parties have already, they've been damaged significantly in many of those cases. It's a much different kind of dynamic around this political class. How much, I got two minutes? Okay. So um, I guess part of this is just a question I want to hear your own comments on it. Um, because I think that when you're thinking about um, reinventing democracy, then number one, there's going to be a lot of important activity that comes, that comes about that's just outside the state. And some of it might not be even directed at the state at all. But yet there can be a source of innovation in terms of how people collectively collaborate in ways that render their equality operational. The second is a strategic question. Given the kind of economic subordination that the state finds itself in, then why not just democratize the economy? Why not just then go after, you know, I mean, this is part of the drive of Occupy Wall Street. It wasn't Occupy the Beltway. Um, the idea is the, the, the center of gravity is over there, then go over there and let's get new economic forms then that are democratic within the economy. And maybe that's the best way to influence the political system anyway. Um, the other question though is that as we reinvent, how do we think about that conception of the political class and the professional class and what counts as labor? Um, and what sort of institutional models then might be uh, more, most amenable to that? So I'll stop there. Very good. Mm -hmm.